You may say I have nothing to hide or I don't say anything the government would want to hear, but why would you allow unwanted intrusions of your privacy? At any given time, there are three to five agencies listening in on your cell phone calls. That includes your text messages and emails, both sent and received, using your mobile phone. DEAF prevents outside entities from listening in by cloaking your phone from all-seeing technology. What they can't see, they can't hack. Sign up now for DEAF at DEFProtection.com. That's DEFProtection.com. If you are watching this video, then we have piqued your curiosity in watching the most factual true crime series on YouTube. True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination. And now, here is your host, Alan Gotro. The definition of depravity is a moral corruption or wickedness. On this channel, we have profiled several individuals who basically stand as a prime example of this definition. In this profile, we see the epitome of decadence and mostly evil. Using young people as a release for certain desires, this perpetrator may have escaped earthly justice, but one in his small circle of associates determined that he reached a breaking point and in eradicating this evil assailant, destroyed a malevolent monster. At 8.24 a.m. on August 8, 1973, the Pasadena, Texas Police Department received a telephone call from a young man who stated he was 18 years old and had just murdered a grown man. The caller gave the operator the address located at 2020 Lamar Drive. When the police made it to the scene, they noted that three teenagers sat on the front porch with a loaded 22 pistol lying nearby on the driveway. One of the young people stated that they were the one that called the police. The young man identified himself as Elmer Wayne Henley and informed the police on the scene that the dead man was inside of the house. After police confiscated the weapon and placed the three teenagers in the back of the patrol car and then walked into the house, they discovered the body of 33-year-old Dean Arnold Coral, shot dead with a 22 caliber pistol. When police exited the residence, they walked over to the patrol car, read Henley his rights, and placed him under arrest for Coral's murder. Henley then shouted, I don't care who knows, I have to get this off my chest. One of the victims informed the detectives that Henley told him, I got $200 for you. As investigators delved further into the case, they realized that the man Henley killed led a life full of debauchery and became one of the most prolific serial killers in the United States at that time. Dean Coral, also known as the Candy Man of Houston, enlisted other young men to lure young boys and teenagers into his lair of torture and murder. This macabre practice lasted for a long time, and had Henley not murdered Coral, more innocent victims stood to lose their lives. Dean Arnold Coral was born on Christmas Day December 25, 1939, in Waynesdale, Indiana, to an overbearing mother, Mary, and Arnold, who, as it turns out, did not like children. Coral's parents continuously argued, and home life was anything but stellar. Arnold Coral proved to be a very strict disciplinarian to Coral and his brother Stanley, and Mary and Arnold divorced in 1946, with Arnold leaving them to join the army. The Coral boys spent time with an elderly couple as their mother, Mary, went to work. Arnold and Mary Coral tried to reconcile, but the difference proved too harrowing. After this attempt to rekindle the marriage failed, Mary took the two boys from where they lived in Tennessee and moved to Houston, Texas. After a brief bout with rheumatic fever, 
The doctors diagnosed Coral with a congenital heart defect and frowned on the young man from engaging in sports. This seemed fine, as the young Coral felt more comfortable with being a loner, whereas his brother Stanley was outgoing and had a good sense of humor. Mary eventually remarried to a clock salesman, Jake West, and the couple soon had a daughter. Coral became very overprotective of his siblings and often found himself being their bodyguard. Also around this time, Coral found a hobby, scuba diving, but had to give it up when he passed out one day while enjoying the hobby, an obvious result of the heart defect. In 1953, after a brief divorce because of irreconcilable differences, Mary remarried Jake West. Based upon the recommendation of a neighbor, Mary Coral, now West, went to a small business where she sold candy out of the family's garage. Coral at the time worked for his mother running errands and such. And after high school, Coral moved briefly to live in Indiana to care for his stepfather's mother. When Coral rejoined the family, he got a job with the Houston Lighting and Power Company. He worked that job during the day and worked with the family making candles at night. With his attitude toward working hard and trying to be successful, Coral impressed several young women that shopped in his mother's business. But Coral did not really express any interest in females. In 1964, the United States drafted Coral into the Army. Military service seemed to change the young man as he noticed an attraction to his superior officers. It was then that Coral realized that he was gay. Up until this time, he realized something was off, so to speak, and felt out of place. Now that he understood his apprehensions, he now knew what course to take in his romantic life. When Coral returned from the Army after an 11-month assignment, he noted that his parents argued incessantly over the course that the family business should take. Subsequently, his father kicked Mary out of the store and she took the rest of the children and moved elsewhere, starting her own business again. Coral did not seem bothered by the conflict within the family and found himself in an apartment not too far from where his mother lived. Coral started hanging out with boys, a lot younger than he, preferably teenage boys. It was easy to get them to his apartment because he always had piles of candy lying around. Although he enjoyed the company of young boys, Coral once forced his mother to fire a male worker because he made a pass at Coral. He reacted with almost a disgusting outrage, yet still young boys felt threatened to be left alone in a room with Coral. Coral's mother decided she wanted to marry again. This time, Mary's choice turned out to be a seaman whom Mary considered quite dull and thick in the head. The marriage survived two divorces and finally, Mary moved herself and the rest of the children to Dallas, Texas. Coral decided to stay in Houston as he wanted the freedom away from his protective mother. Coral realized that his attraction to younger boys stemmed from a protective nature rather than a sexual one. What others never seemed to realize was that Coral may have been acting as a protective sibling, yet underneath that candy man exterior, there skulked the heart of a sexual maniac that would turn violent, given enough time. In 1969, Coral learned that some of the boys that were allowed into his apartment would accept money in exchange for oral sex. One boy in particular, 14-year-old David Brooks, loved being around Coral and really looked up to the older man as a big brother and mentor. Eventually, Brooks moved in with Coral and lived there for a while as the teenager became very emotionally dependent on the elder Coral. Coral continued to work with the lighting company and decided that he needed a storage unit with which to store his other belongings. This proved to be an important fact as later events transpired. Coral turned more depressed and despondent for some reason and Brooks tried to cheer him up. Coral continued to pay $5 to Brooks every time he wanted the teenager to perform fellatio on him. Coral decided he needed more than just the short sexual encounters he paid for with Brooks. On September 25, 1970, 21-year-old Jeffrey Conan left the University of Texas campus and hitchhiked home to Houston. Coral, driving down the highway, 
saw Conan and decided to give him a ride. The two arrived at Coral's apartment and after some pleasantries, Coral overpowered the young man and bound and gagged him. Coral then sexually abused the youth he held in bondage and then murdered him. Now a murderer, Coral dumped Conan's body and resumed his life as if nothing ever happened. That psychopathic demeanor finally surfaced and kept perpetuating Coral's motives over the next few years. The assailant realized that he enjoyed the wholesale uninhibited torture of young boys. He found sexual satisfaction in the brutal treatment and then sodomization of young boys. Coral now believed he could find a steady supply of victims, luring them to his apartment and offering them drugs and alcohol in exchange for sexual favors. Even though some of the boys would perform oral sex on the older man for a mere five dollars, Coral soon became dissatisfied with just that facet of homosexual sex. Coral wanted penetration. He wanted sodomy, and his anger escalated to the point of brutality and even murder. In a later interview, Brooks told police that one day he arrived at Coral's apartment unannounced. When he opened the door, Brooks noticed Coral wandering the apartment nude. When Brooks went into the bedroom, he found two young boys strapped to what can only be described as torture boards. Brooks left the apartment feeling used and depressed. Subsequently, Coral tried to make it up to the young man by buying him a new Corvette. According to Brooks, this gift was meant to buy the young man's silence as Coral admitted to him that he killed the two young boys from the apartment and dumped their bodies. But the Corvette would serve another purpose for Coral. Brooks would drive him around to find other victims. On one occasion, Coral and Brooks cruised the local areas and one youth accepted their offer of dope smoking and partying all night. Coral subdued the young boy and tied him to his torture rack, brutalizing and then sodomizing the youth. Brooks witnessed Coral strangle the young boy to death, then assisted the serial killer with dumping the body near Lake Sam Rayburn. Prior to his 31st birthday, Coral decided to have a party at his apartment on Columbia Street in Houston. On December 15, 1970, Brooks and Coral lured 15-year-old Danny Yates and 14-year-old James Glass to the apartment for a party. Ironically, Yates and Glass were friends who met at a church social group. Brooks related that Coral moved swiftly to subdue the boys, tying them up and then sodomizing them. Brooks watched as Coral strangled both boys to death. But instead of dumping the bodies, Brooks and Coral brought them to a boat shed that Coral recently rented on Silver Street. On May 29, 1971, Coral went cruising in his white van when he noticed two young boys walking along the street. The two boys headed to a swimming pool and then when Coral approached them, they accepted a ride. The two boys, David Hillegeist and George Winkle, got into the van and off they went. Once they arrived at Coral's apartment, the older man quickly subdued them, tied them up and tortured them. Coral then forced Winkle to call his parents later that evening and told them he was going to Freeport with some friends. The assailant then sodomized and murdered the two young boys. When the two boys did not return home over the following days, their parents circulated posters and handbills with contact information should anyone see the two. The parents even brought in a psychic that informed the parents that David and George were dead. One of David Hillegeist's best friends, Elmer Wayne Henley, took a special interest in the families of the missing boys and sought to comfort them as much as possible. On August 17, 1971, 17-year-old Reuben Watson left his residence and decided to go to the cinema. As Watson walked along the street headed toward the movies, Coral and Brooks slowed down beside the young man and offered him a ride to his destination. Watson accepted and instead of heading to the movies, the three wound up at Coral's apartment. Coral dehumanized Watson until his boredom took over and he killed the young man. At this point, Brooks became a willing participant in Coral's dark consumption of young human lives. Coral seemed to be growing bored of Brooks as well, and when he met another young man, he gave his proposed protege a task, knock out Brooks. 
The associate did so willingly, and when Brooks awoke, he noticed an extreme pain in his rear area and he was tied to a torture board. Despite the treatment dispensed to him by his mentor, Brooks did not speak of the incident until much later. But Brooks remained very loyal to Coral. The newest member of this demonic triumvirate was Elmer Wayne Henley. Coral came to the realization that he fell in love with Henley and admired his independence, something that Brooks did not display due to his emotional dependence on Coral. Furthermore, Coral knew that he could buy Henley and the young man would do anything for money. Henley later denied that Coral offered $200 for every mail that Henley brought to the torture chamber, but the young man denied it. Coral even went so far as to justify his murder of the young males by saying that they meant nothing to society and they would not be missed, with most of them being delinquents and a burden. Coral proved insatiable when it came to sex and murder. By September 27, 1971, Coral decided he needed to be quenched. So he and Brooks kidnapped brothers named Jerry, 14, and Danny, 13, Waldrop. Coral saw the kidnap, brutalization, and murder of these young boys to be celebratory in nature as he just moved to a new apartment and felt that event needed sort of a christening. The Waldrop brothers underwent the same torture as Yates and Glass, even the disposition of their bodies at the boat shed which started to follow a familiar pattern that Coral began. On February 24, 1972, Coral abducted and murdered Frank Aguirre, 19 years old. This murder took place in front of Aguirre's girlfriend, 14-year-old Rhonda Williams. Subsequently, without Williams' statement, no one would have believed the sheer evil that Coral exhibited on young men and children. On May 21, 1972, Coral, Brooks, and Henley grabbed two victims for Coral's consumption, 16-year-old Johnny DeLome and 17-year-old Billy Balch. Coral and the other two brought DeLome and Balch back to Coral's apartment where the older man tortured and raped the two boys for hours. Henley shot DeLome to death with Coral strangling Balch. Michael Balch, Billy's brother, later became Coral's victim in November of 1972. Again, Coral ordered the corpses deposited on High Island where they were buried. On October 3, 1972, Henley, Brooks, and Coral abducted 13-year-old Richard Hembray and 14-year-old Wally Semino and brought them back to Coral's apartment. Under the impression they were headed to a party, Coral gave the two boys paint and glue to sniff which brought on unconsciousness. Once the two boys passed out, Coral ordered Brooks and Henley to bring the young boys into his bedroom and lash them to the torture boards. Coral did not murder the two instantly after gratification. He had his way with the two, raping and torturing them for days. Hembray and Simino were later discovered amongst the victims buried at the boathouse. Several more victims suffered the same fate as the previous unfortunate young boys. On June 11, 1973, 15-year-old Billy Lawrence fell for the ruse presented through Brooks and Henley of an alcoholic party. On July 7, 15-year-old Homer Garcia. On July 27, less than three weeks after Garcia's murder, 17-year-old Charles Cobble and 18-year-old Marty Jones. And during the first week of August 1973, 13-year-old James Dramala and an unidentified nine-year-old boy. In the afternoon of August 8, 1973, Henley arrived at Coral's apartment with two more intended victims, 16-year-old Timothy Curley for Coral and 14-year-old Wanda Williams, the former girlfriend of victim Frank Aguirre. Williams decided she wanted to run away from home and took Henley into her confidence with this decision. Coral flew into a rage when Henley brought Williams to the apartment. When the three finally became unconscious, Coral decided to teach Henley a lesson when he finally awoke along with Curly and Williams. When they awoke, the three realized Coral had tied them up, but not to the torture boards, not yet. Henley knew what was going to happen when he saw Coral's face, still expressing the rage of Williams' appearance at the apartment. 
Henley pleaded with Coral to let him go, stating he would rape and kill Rhonda Williams while Coral did the same to Timothy Curley. Coral then took Curley to his bedroom and forced the young man to disrobe, gagged him, and tied him to the torture board. After untying Henley, Coral motioned to Henley that he do the same thing with Williams. The point came to Henley where he had to maintain his end of the bargain regarding his freedom. Henley had some difficulty achieving an erection and Coral, who found the predicament humorous, began to cruelly taunt the young man. Henley decided at that point he had had enough of Coral and picked up a nearby 22 caliber revolver and pointing it at the older man. When Coral saw that Henley brandished the revolver, he taunted the young man even further. He mocked Henley when he said, Go on, Wayne. Kill me, why don't you? Coral moved toward Henley, and the young man fired six shots into Coral's chest, killing him instantly. It was then that Henley called the police. After rescuing Curly and Williams, Henley later decided to tell the police the whole truth about the reign of terror that Coral's projected onto the local Houston, Texas population and the metropolitan area. The young man told of the parties, the torture, the depravity, and the murders. Henley also listed the names of the victims in order to convince the police that his statements proved genuine. The authorities realized that three of the victims appeared on their missing persons list. When Henley notified the police of the boathouse, investigators descended on the property. The first body found was that of the 13-year-old's remains wrapped in a large garbage bag. At that point, crime scene investigators were called and the excavations began. The smell of decaying human remains permeated the air, and Henley, whom authorities brought to the site in the hopes of identifying some of the corpses, allegedly cried as each body was unearthed. Henley said, It was all my fault because I introduced him to the boys. Henley then delivered the whole story to the police as he related about the lure of drugs and alcohol to the young victims. Henley also admitted to committing some of the murders himself. David Brooks, who had escaped some time earlier from Coral's clutches, watched the news on the television and decided to go to the police and tell all he knew. When Brooks arrived at the police station, interrogators notified Henley and he stated, Good, now I can tell the whole story. Authorities wondered what other depraved details Henley would offer. Brooks related that the three of them, Coral, Henley, and himself, were involved in the killings after Henley joined the trio. Brooks then stated that Coral loved to watch people in pain. David Brooks faced trial and the state of Texas found him guilty in six of the murders. Henley stood trial in July 1974 and was found guilty of murder. The court sentenced him to six 99-year terms of imprisonment. Henley's shooting of Coral proved to be justifiable homicide. In December 1978, the Texas Supreme Court overturned Henley's conviction, citing pre-trial publicity that prejudiced a fair trial. In June of 1979, a court again convicted Henley of the murders and bestowed a sentence of life imprisonment without the benefit of parole. In 2006, both Brooks and Henley, then in their late 40s, still sat in prison. Every three years, they make application for parole, and in each instance, the parole board rejects those appeals. Henley, like most lifers, took up painting and raised the uproar of parents of the murdered children when he tried to sell them on eBay. This reminded some of another serial killer who painted as he waited for the final judgment. During the time that Coral Brooks and Henley murdered young males, 28 young men between the ages of 13 and 20 were abducted, brutalized, and then murdered by the three in the Houston area. After the 26th and 27th victims that Coral and company murdered, the police called off the search for any further disappearances. At the discovery of the 27th victim, authorities noticed that this grave contained extra bones an arm bone, and a pelvis, which indicated that there may have been additional victims.
Despite the fact that Elmer Wayne Henley informed police that there were two more bodies unaccounted for at High Island, the police called off the search for further bodies in August 1973. Although reports surfaced that three men had been seen digging on the beach in late 1972, the police still would not renew the search at High Island. Workers that were employed at the candy company that Mary Coral owned and operated later recalled that Coral did a lot of digging prior to 1968. Was this in preparation for a diabolical obsession? Parents of the two sets of brothers that Coral abducted heavily criticized the Houston police for the handling of the Coral case. Perhaps if they had paid more attention to the disappearances, families would not have had to grieve. On May 28, 2020, David Allen Brooks died as a result of an underlying condition with a contributing factor to his death being a COVID-19 positive test result. The final tally of the Houston Pied Piper, some law enforcement officials have stated, is 28, with many of them still unidentified. But some say the total could be higher. Until next time. Hello everyone, this is Alan Goto, your host of True Crime Man's Dark Imagination. If you would like to support our channel, you can become a member of Subscribestar. There are different levels and subscribers get special privileges. Also, we do have a PayPal account. If you enjoy our work here, please think about subscribing. I will leave the links below in the comment section. We thank you very much for your viewing and please stay tuned for future programs.